That's what I got. Hi everyone, welcome to Rizzoli Bookstore. Thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, we're very excited to celebrate the publication of this beautiful book, The Shadow of the Sun, Ross Bleckner and Zachary Logan. Um, we're thrilled to have both of them here in conversation and we'll have Wayne and Joseph um, moderating. Um, so we'll start with a conversation between the two of you and um, we'll have an audience Q&A and a chance to like have your book signed at the end. Um, if you'd like to purchase a book, just find me. I can help you with that. Um, and just a reminder to keep your mask on during the event, except for the, the speakers. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Um, thank you guys for coming, and I'm gonna turn it over to our guests. Hello. Thanks, Christina. Thanks to everyone at Missoli here for putting this together and uh, promoting it properly. It's been really great. Um, now, some of you might know about the two-person show, uh, Zachary and Ross's show at Wave Hill, yeah. which closed in, in August. Yeah, we've had great reviews and, and a great response all along. So if you don't know about that, please go to the Wave Hill website and have a look. There's great documentation there. Um, I just thought I'd give you a couple of brief biographical notes uh, for those that don't know uh, the work of Zachary and Ross. So I'll just do a quick reading here, very brief, but I'll just leave you in a bit, I hope. Uh, Ross received his Bachelor of Arts degree from New York U and his uh, Master of Fine Arts degree from the California Institute of the Arts in Valencia. And for more than 30 years, Ross's paintings and mixed media works have been largely an investigation of change, loss, and mourning, and memory, often addressing the subject of AIDS. <laughs> He's well known for his large scale paintings and his works are in public and private collections throughout the world. In addition to his New York City studio practice and Long Island studio practice, he has taught at many universities and currently and is currently a clinical professor of studio art at New York University. Zachary holds a BFA and MFA from the University of Saskatchewan's Art, art History Department in Saskatoon, in Canada. Since graduating in 2008, Logan has maintained a studio practice focusing on drawing, painting, ceramics, and installation. His work centers on an imaginatively complicated figurative representation of place, its flora, fauna, and occasionally human forms in their various states of visibility and invisibility. His work has also been exhibited widely uh, throughout Canada, North America, and uh, Europe and in India. His, his work is found in many public and private collections. So I think we'll start this evening um, by asking uh, Ross and uh, Zachary to talk a little, about, a little about their studio practices and how they met, which I think is very important, of course, and how they came to realize early on that they shared an exploration of memory, loss, and uh, notions of presence and absence in their studio practices and have a particular chemistry that really is quite remarkable and allows them to make collaborative works, some of which you'll see uh, this evening on the screen. So please join us in welcoming them. Yeah. <laughs> My memory is 
like to ask a uh, Yeah, my work is always, you know, from the 80s. Uh, I had been doing abstract painting for that sometimes in, in uh, real life. Mm -hmm. Talk. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I've known about Ross's work since uh, my first year at university when I was introduced to it by um, one of my uh, favorite people, very important uh, prof, um, Alison Orland. And I um, was instantly enamored with it, um, in part because of the way the work sort of deals with um, the body, with embodiment. Um, and also the this, this scale, there was this sort of monumental scale, um, uh, and the work that you were doing was on a similar scale to a lot of your contemporaries, but the work felt so queer and so intimate, even though it was on this um, magically large scale. Um, so it just really, really stuck with me, uh, really uh, touched me from the very beginning. And then, you know, I was curating the show, and. And yeah, as chance would happen, I went up to the wrong floor and saw your name there. And then you just responded so beautifully. Um, you just said, yeah, sure, I'll do your show. And then you sent me another email and you said, I just Googled Saskatchewan, where is that? And <laughs> what's your studio like? And what's the weather like? And come see me the next time you're in New York. Well, was really very, very fascinated by Agnes Smart. Yes. And the whole, uh, I guess, uh, mystique around where she comes from and who she is and, and the lands, basically, she's a landscape painter yeah. uh, and I was kind of zen landscape painter and I loved that <laughs> idea and uh, I was kind of curious uh, if I'm going to travel to go to places that are more remote and exotic to me and that seemed very exotic to me but uh, what I was going to say before is that uh, making abstract paintings for a while. Uh, you know, there are things that come in, you know, you, you also live in your life and you live in a world. So living in the world and at that time, you know, in the 80s and the 80s epidemic was kind of full, full blown. Uh, in New York, they kind of, I realized that there was a kind of systemic fracture in in the way we live and what what we feared and what we thought about and our idea of industrial optimism had now been taken over right. by the fear of early death. And I think that created a big shift in my thinking and my practice, the idea of uh, the fragility. Yeah, and that was something that I um, responded to in your work, um, and it's something that's always has always been in the forefront um, of my own work. Even when I'm thinking about materials, I think about fragility, and you know, the, the drawings are massive. They're made out of very, very delicate materials. They could just dust off, and they're just pinned to the wall. And that's really what that's about: um, is that sense of the fleetingness. Um, and also, you know, I was very, I'm still kind of a, you know, I love the idea of modernism, uh, the kind of abstract expressionist idea, I, idealism of, of, of uh, universality and the oneness and, uh, of, of things, but in reality. That's not the case because things are much more fractured and broken open. Right. So when I'm done, I was trying to deal with the ship, with that ship. Uh, so, you know, I started doing paintings that were much more, well, figurative in a way. Uh, that's where the birds and the things and the falling and uh, numbers and names. The cellular. Huh? The, the cellular. The, the, the molecular. molecular. You know, I was trying to, yeah, trying to, I got really uh, interested in investigating the actual mechanism and 
the machination of the body, how kind of how it works and how it doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, and oddly enough, we don't live in a modern age. We actually don't. Everyone thinks we do. But you know, when you're living in an age that goes from a lot of people here, uh, I don't know the age range, but uh, in my in my in my life, uh, basically now it turns out it's parenthetically uh, enclosed between two epidemics. That is not modern. That to me actually seems uh, middle ages. <laughs> But you know, that's how people live in fear of immortality. Yeah, and fear the next thing that's going to come along. Yeah. The next plague, the next this, and the next break. Yeah. And yeah. I grew up in consciousness and in, in, in movement forward. And that's what happened. And I mean, actually, my paintings, even in the last year, I noticed they deal so much with breathing. And the lungs, this part of the body, you know, trying to open up and be, find air, yeah. you know, like that's, you know, the idea about health is so much about air. Mm -hmm. I mean, climate change and air, losing it. Uh, I mean, I don't do it directly and not like a quote unquote political artist, but yeah. in my, Kind of in my mind, uh, there's a, an abstraction to it all. Yeah. But it's what we think about. We don't necessarily think about it literally yes. all the time. But it, it's all this stuff that's always hovering above us. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I think I recognize that in, in your work. But it, I grew up at a different um, timeline in the um, AIDS epidemic. Um, and I, I think I, I internalized it in a, in a slightly different way, but I also uh, came into my own um, in terms of my studio practice and imagery and, and thinking about what I wanted to make and what I wanted to say. Um, and I was, I've been, always been very interested in, in the art historical source, which you have as well. Um, but I just I feel like I did not see myself uh, or queer bodies uh, represented. And I, but I definitely did see that in, in your work, but historically I didn't see that. So the earlier part of my practice, which was sort of absorbed by the use of my own body, sort of presenting myself as these sort of um, heterosexist or uh, accepted masculine tropes, um, there was something in, in seeing your work in the way that you work with materials and, and imagery and this iconography that you repeated and, and, and still continue to repeat, which totally admires me and fascinates me, um, that I really wanted to, obviously, first of all, include you in that show, and then and then came the conversation with Wayne, who I worked with at the IKG in Calgary, and he said, well, I honestly think that there are some really interesting overlaps in the way that you think about the body and embodiment and queerness and aesthetics, and I think we could create a really interesting show. And so that's really, that's sort of, you were the, and, and also, you know, the, there's a kind of uh, yielding of darkness and lightness that's in both work. Right, I mean, and representative. Yeah, I mean, you know, not, not, just, not just metaphorical darkness and metaphorical lightness, uh, but, but actual formal, Formally, uh, your use of darks and lights, and just the way I admire you uh, <laughs> as an artist who I see as being kind of similar to me in terms of your discipline and your practice, very different. I feel I I feel that I'm a very decentered artist. Like I'm all over the place. I do this and then I do that, and then I get bored with this work. That, and you're very centered. I'm having memories of this of being in the studio with you. You, I may be centered, but I'm, I'm filthy, and you are. <laughs> well, I know. But that's something else. <laughs> that's something else. But, 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 but your, your patience and your concentration uh, 
would drive me out of my mind. So that I mean, to see, to be around him, to be around an artist whose work is so beautiful and has the patience to actually sit there and do it. Well, I mean, themselves, no less. I mean, a lot of artists would have like five assistants doing it for them. Oh, no. All of the day. Uh, but, but also, I, I was equally fascinated and enamored with watching you go around your room, around well, your studio, which is a silo. It's an enormous, beautiful studio, and there's always 20 paintings or more that Ross is working on at any given moment, and it's, it's remarkable. And I do, uh, you're right, I work in the exact opposite way. I can't, um, I have a focus for one thing, or else I'm, I'm scattered and unable to do multiple things. So part of it too is, you know, this just the experience of seeing you in your studio and, and maybe seeing me, how I work, because being in a studio is a very monastic thing. It can be very lonesome, melancholic, which is very helpful. Um, but at times, it's nice to sort of wish for melancholic. It can be helpful, and and also that, 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 being alone with your own thoughts. That's like you know, double edged. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And I guess it depends on where you are at any given moment. But um, just that you know, you, you were very generous in all, for also opening up your studio. Um, and being open to working collaboratively, which the first collaborations actually happened at a distance. So Ross had sent me uh, two pieces that were um, related to a series of works that I uh, am also very uh, in love with. And so I was, first of all, shocked that I was asked to sort of add to these works, because they keep a few talk a little bit about the New York Times obituaries work right. and the, the New York Times obituaries work that you, the okay. collections of the, um, you had done a series of lithograph uh, with um, polygrapha, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we were at the studio, uh, Wayne was there, Paul was there, and we were talking about materials and just talking openly about how we would collaborate, what we would do, and I said, well, I don't know, like, maybe paper, because I'm um, and Ross said, mm, I don't think I have any, anything on paper. I don't really work on paper a lot. <laughs> and Nathan, who is Ross's lovely assistant, just shook his head and said, come over here. And we went over to these uh, enormous flat files and literally found hundreds of words. They were at drawings, paintings on paper, and we were just like drooling. And um, speak about generous, not only did he pull out work, but then he was like, oh, I think I want to do it. And he started just in real time painting on one of his uh, paper prints. So that was incredible. <laughs> one of the first studio visits. Um, but, but your response at the beginning, too, was to yes. add to that collaboration. Yeah, exactly. So, so at that point, what happened was uh, Ross then had work sent to my studio in Regina. Um, and I responded to them, I drew, uh, and there are, uh, well, they're flashing on the screen. Um, perhaps we can, let me see that. Uh, where do you want to stop? Actually, uh, yeah, beautiful. There's a dumb thing. Uh, I'm just gonna. <coughs> yeah. These, these. these. Are you gonna read this What's that? This. Um, so this is one of this is the one of the two. Oh, and there we are. Uh, oh yeah, just we, uh, I'll go back to the door. Yeah. Now I flip through. Thank you. Just bear with me. Uh, basically, yeah, so. I take a page from the New York 
requirements of the tourism, um, made it like uh, silver, you know, like, like a mirror. Yeah. And I cross out the date above, as you can see. So it's kind of like you're looking at this ring and you're kind of vaguely seeing an image of yourself. Yeah. But there's no date. So these showed up in my studio, and I just stared at them probably for three weeks because I was afraid to, <laughs> or afraid. I needed I needed to consider what I was going to do, and um, and Ross sent me a note inside of a book that he gave me on one of my first studio visits, and it was with a a sharpie, um, and I just decided. I thought about that, and I decided just to draw on top of this with a sharpie. So that's that's so. <laughs> um, yeah. And the next one. Sorry. So it's like graphite on. Yeah, it's just graphite on. Um, Did you do that in my studio? Or did no, you do that this here? was in Regina. Yeah. Okay. And so these are the first two, and that sort of sparked the idea of, of carrying this on. Um, Ross uh, liked the result, uh, and and then we were thinking about how we could do this, and thought, well, why don't I just travel to the Hamptons? <laughs> and Ross was, um, again, very generous in having me come and stay there for a week. And then, yeah, and then we, we just sort of, um, I brought some of my materials to the table, and Ross brought some of his, and we stared at each other. We stared at each other for a moment and said, "What are we gonna do?" <laughs> and then uh, and he said, and he draws with his brush pen. Yeah, and then and he, I clean up bathrooms. Yeah, so this is where that comes in. <laughs> at one point, we were both working at the same table, and Ross said, "Okay, stop, stop. It's too messy. <laughs> too messy." Because my, my pastels are very messy, but I also, um, again, my focus is simply on the materials. I don't care what's happening in the periphery. Whereas um, I've seen Ross walking around the studio, he always has a thing of bounty in his hand. <laughs> he always has a uh, on his hand. So, yeah. But it was, it, I, it, I felt very natural, very, you know, in some ways, very sort of zen, very, you know, we just sort of passed it back and forth. And it, to me, anyway, it felt like a, a conversation in images. Oh, and yeah. the other thing is, it, it is nice to have uh, people in your studio, I think. I mean, because like you were saying, the, the melancholy and the aloneness, yeah. the solitude, uh, I mean, I find that actually, it's almost like an occupational hazard. Uh, melancholy? What? Or aloneness? Mm -hmm. you know? No. You don't have to be an artist at a melon Oh, exactly. You, you are an uh, artist in this when you alone can sometimes get a little bit lonely. I mean, I, you know, I always say to the kids in, uh, you know, graduate school, where I teach at NYU, this is the most talk about your work you're going to ever get. <laughs> Heated up. Once you get out of here, you're going to make those calls and nobody is going to respond. <laughs> you know? Um, and it sucks. And I went through it, and you know, suddenly you're thrown in a room by yourself, and, and after you know, you've gone through this two years of everybody talking about all the issues around everything. All the time, and there's silence, and then silence. Can and, you tell and, us uh, about the conversation? What? Can you tell us about the conversations that you had with each other as you're working together in the studio? Oh, at one point you told me to get lost. <laughs> <laughs> you said, "Okay, exactly, take a break. You've done too much. Go to the Paula Krasner house because it's literally down the block from me." Um, and so I did. It was great. Yeah, yeah it was necessary. Yeah. Did you talk about art ever? Well, we did, I think. 
I think we did, but oh, I can't. I can't. You know, it's funny when you when you're like in this video of making art. It's like you talk about art a little, but it's it's a little more utilitarian. It's like Basically, we did talk about, talk about the actual what are you making, how are you making it, the material. I mean, I'm very, I'm you know part part of the way I work. I'm very interested in like the actual chemistry of it all, the materiality, the touching, the touch. The putting together of and blending of different things, uh, he sticks much more with a little tiny box of pastels with different colors. And for me, it's like to get all of that out of that little box, you know, is like kind of amazing. It's very condensed. Uh, Why well, your studio is pretty well kind of. Like it's you know you have um, you want you mix. Works, I like to make the paint. Yeah, and uh, you the, the addition of graphite. And yeah, I like to put stuff in the mix and, and boil. And and do you think that the like contrast between the way you work was productive? Huh? The contrast between the two different ways. Yeah, I absolutely, absolutely do. Think so yeah, make sure. yeah. Both, both are a little OCD. Yeah. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> but I also think that you were, um, I don't, uh, maybe I'm wrong on this, but I think you had mentioned something about working, for example, on Mylar, or some of the papers that I brought that I usually work on, that you were, uh, you really liked the experience of that. I don't know those weapons, but did you paint them? I did. Yeah, did I did. Yeah, well, actually, that, I just gave you paints and I, we painted. We painted together. I showed you. It didn't end the surface. You did, yes. Yeah. And that, for whatever reason, that piece didn't, uh, it's maybe somewhere in your studio. I don't know, but it didn't end up in the show. Um, but we do have an image of it, actually. It'll flash on the screen. But was but, that piece made after the show? No. No. Um, and then actually, this uh, last. Uh, May when I was here for the Wade Hill show, I came up and um, I stayed prepared, here. For, did I prepare? You did. Yourself? Yes. So I I now paint this. Yes. Yeah. So I painted a still life, and then Ross came and you you worked on on the surface, and then so it was like another little clever painting. Yeah. So yeah, we. I mean, the, the, and the first part was more uh, the materials that I regularly use. So you know, when I came time to. Um, do it again. I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to actually um, see it raw. Yeah, and he mixed it all and, and just sort of um, sort of gave me that experience to step into his shoes in a, in a, in a way, and it was really lovely. Yeah. But talk, I don't know, other than more sort of practicalities, I guess. Yeah, I would love to talk about the the meaning of the art. Um, okay. The my, the meaning of your art, like the collaborative, the collaborative works. Or uh, one thing that interests me a lot is the queerness that one can read into your works. Um, and to me, it's always seemed to have a lot to do with the kind of unabashed sentimentality that you allow in, which seems a kind of you know anti-modern gesture in a way. You know, melancholy maybe is allowed in modernism, but. Well, melancholy is, melancholy is a generalized term. I mean, you know, I mean, for me, like you talk about Marcotto, I mean, he certainly was gay. You know. But anyway, the point is that I feel that for me, uh, I've always been clearly uh, ident I identify myself as a gay artist. But what does that mean? What it means is that the way I feel the world, I feel is different from the way uh, my male counterparts deal with the world. I feel that um, in the old days, people would, would sometimes say my work was kind of overly uh, sentimental. And I feel that that was part I mean, I would just, uh, I feel that 
straight man would not make the painting I make. Whatever it is about them, I don't know, but you know. Maybe it's in not in the 80s, they certainly weren't uh, like neo expressionists. You know, there was another kind of, you know, it, 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 it's not always, I know that there's a big queer thing going on now that's very liberal, you know, and specifically deals with uh, the sex and sexuality. But I, and, uh, and for me, uh, it, it has to do really with, with a kind of um, a, a, sens a sensibility, uh, a kind of, you know, a mood, a, a place that maybe you can read and maybe you don't read. Uh, but it's just our, our way of seeing the world is slightly different. And I think that when you describe that, it doesn't necessarily, uh, it doesn't have to be literal. But when, when I look at all my paintings uh, overall, they look to me like a gay man making and, and yeah, I think um, my realization of what you know queerness is to me visually is realization that my body is nature. So part of it is, I guess, an ecological stance. I don't see a separation between body and land. They are the same thing. So it, it's also to dispel a notion that there is something that is unnatural versus something that's natural that can you know be, uh, come down to sexuality, but materiality, like it, it's just. Um, so that's the main uh, focus, and I feel like it's something that I saw in, in Ross's work too, um, that he um, articulates beautifully in, I think, what Ross, or sorry, what Wayne described in his essay as sort of slippage. There's all these like, references to nature and art history, but then they're shifted. And perhaps that shift is that sort of queer lens that you're was also saying that things have changed since in the day. Of what? Right. Have them. But, but I think in the day, if we're talking about the 70s and 80s, when that sort of sensitivity, that sensibility you're talking about, might have been used in the pejorative sense. It's kind of come full circle now, and it's actually a plus <laughs> for one's work. So I think, are you not going back to that era when this sort of, this notion of even being pre-modern? Was. I mean, certainly things have changed, and Ross's work is one of the reasons why they have changed. Um, and I think there's an embrace of the kind of romantic sentimentality that you've always been interested in that you know wouldn't have happened in the 1980s when everything had to be ironic. You know what? It's also funny when I remember being younger, and I had actually. I haven't seen the John show yet. I do love John's work. But I used to read all this crap about like whether he was coming out, whether he was showing that he was a gay man or hiding it. And I used to think, who the fuck cares? Just show it already. I mean, what is all this hiding behind the, you know, uh, you know, like a thing? Or maybe it is, and maybe it is. And that's that, and that, that actually always used to be, I always had trouble with that in his work. You know, this kind of game. The biggest that open he, secret of that. Novel. So what? Say it already. I, I don't know if the show says it. <laughs> it does finally. What? <clears throat> the, the labels on the walls do finally say that he is a gay man. Well, the work, of course the labels say it. The labels say everything. But is it in the work? I, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's an argument that you can go either way. <laughs> well, that was good. <laughs> <laughs>
any, any questions? Yeah, yeah, we're trying to be informal here. Any comments or questions uh, that we could take at this moment? Please. Yes. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Well, my name is Valentino, and I want well, I will ask both of you. Can you do me a favor and take your mask off for a second? I wanted to ask you, after you said, um, you mentioned the part that we study at universities and we talk about, the, uh, about our artworks, we talk, we talk, we study, and then we are thrown into silence in our studios for many years till we see it or blah, 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 blah. I have another question, but it's about this. But in my gallery, we have art talks and workshops where I work with these with young uh, artists. And I love them to talk about art and their own art artworks. But I think it's a way of, for them to understand what people is what, uh, seeing in their artworks and to make it better and shape it and work on it. So I think this is a point where maybe um, we should work a little bit because contemporary art, it, it, you know, it gets very schizophrenic and maybe the touch of real life. But my question for you, which are established artists, is why? Um, you have a long career artist. It is um, what kind of questions or thoughts you have in your studio that you would like to someone to ask you, maybe, I don't know, in your music. Next time when people come to see you to your studio and you say, oh, this is the kind of things I like to talk about. <laughs> 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 I know, like some intimacy, so we know about them. Uh, what it is that you would want someone coming to your studio to ask you, perhaps that given time? I know yeah. your answer is. Or to well, talk about first of all, first of all I, do, I do like the idea of, uh, of like residency or artists working together or near each other that, you know, that to develop a dialogue. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I like when people uh, come, to my, come into my studio, I mean, whether it's, you know, I have assistants who are artists, usually younger artists, and uh, a lot of times I totally trust them and what they say because, uh, you know, I have, I, <laughs> it also has to do with my own kind of self-doubt, whether I should do this or whether I should do that, and I'm more than happy to listen. You know, it's like that postmodern thing. I'm, you're not the author of your own work. Your own work is kind of comes from the world and voices in it and voices in you that reflect those voices in the world. And if someone comes in with a voice and it's clear to me and they tell me, you should do this, I think, okay, I'll do it. I want to go to the studio. Huh? I want to come to the studio and I'm invited. <laughs> okay, you're invited. <laughs> Uh, you know, I have to see your work and, and, and feel like, you know, if I trust somebody's sense of, I mean, even just their sense of, of composition, the formal things, I mean, I'm not going to get into your head and, you know, the painting's already the painting, but, <laughs> this is the hard part. <laughs> So Ross had someone that he uh, listened to uh, a lot, um, and that person is no longer with us. So it's fairly recent. Sorry. Um, and to answer the same question, uh, I, I, I'm sort of a bit of a loss. I had an idea of what I would what I would ask, but my studio is pretty pretty quiet. I don't often have a lot of people into my studio. I also, um, my husband and I made a conscious decision to stay in a small place um, so that I could have a lot of time and a lot of space and a lot of silence. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I probably also have uh, a level you of self him, You ask him to talk to him. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Ned is, um, I mean, Ned is not an artist. He's a very intelligent person, very interested in art. 
but he's a bureaucrat works for the federal government for the furthest from. But he is the person I think that I um, I ask the most, sure. And I, I ask him the same sort of um, self-doubt questions that Ross um, articulated too. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, that's of course one of the nice things about having, you know, being in New York, and, or uh, an urban area where there, you know, where there's a collective, like in those buildings where there are a lot of artists, uh, and ultimately you end up making friends with with artists and having, you know, kind of uh, dialogue with people. Uh, I think that's one of the, you know, one of the nice things about. And then sometimes it gets to be too much and you have to, you know, kind of separate yourself and just focus on on, on what you want to do and, and have no structure. So you know you have to kind of engage it, you know, when it's good to hear uh, you know, talk uh, and advice and how much advice you're willing to take. I mean, in my case I think I always say Take all the advice I can get. Are you an artist? Uh, I write. I paint very well, but I just uh, have an art gallery. But in Buenos Aires, so we are always all invited to come. I'm just curious about this. Thank you. Uh, when I visited the exhibit at Wave Hill, I really loved that beautiful wall painting that starts going. Yes. Did you both work on that? Uh, no, that was um, so that was a site specific drawing of um, the, the graphite. Yeah. 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 The graphite. Uh, no, no. So this was this sort of cascaded um, all the way across uh, through the doorways, yes. um, okay. and it was called uh, nomenclature too. And it's it, it's a practice that I started in the very first exhibition I had after the uh, pandemic had started. When in its midst, and it's just a sort of simple gesture. Every show I've done since um, has one of these wall drawings, and they're they're simply made to then disappear. So it's just yeah, a gesture so about yeah. time and space. And so you did that when you were down that way to look Yes, yeah, and so it was a, it was also in a direct response to the work in the room and the yeah. structure of the room and the color. Um, I use graphite because uh, with all, with those drawings all the time because um, the way that the graphite changes over the day, also the way that it changes as your body moves across the drawing, so it's it's sort of endlessly changing because of the sheen of the graphite. Yes. But it's also something that's in process of material. It's just a it's it's a seductive, beautiful. Um, I've always been, I've always used it. You know, I started out graduate school. I, how found it, and I've always kind of mixed different things and paint and make, make paint out of it. Uh, it just, it just, you know, I use a lot of uh, iridescent uh, uh, and mica mm -hmm. material, just because of the way that it reflects light. So you know, it adds this other dimension, uh, exactly. and you know. So much about so much about my painting is about, about what light does and light and dark. Well, bringing light out of dark, especially. I mean, it's kind of a corny way to put it, but in the end, that's what it is. Oops. Absolutely, yeah. Ross is painting the relationship to it. I mean, it, Ross's uh, paintings, just like uh, Rothko is uh, fresh in my brain because I just came back from Mountain Ex an Exhibition in Houston. I'd never been there, and so I went to the uh, Rothko Chapel and I was very moved by it. But like Rothko, Ross's paintings are an experience. They're a physical thing. You have to be in front of them. I mean, they, they reproduce beautifully, but they also they have another life in person, um, which I think we're all starved 
for seeing things in person after uh, what we've all um, been through in terms of uh, shutdowns. Um, so that was another part of the gesture of that drawing and just continuing to do it uh, until I stop. <laughs> Sri Lanka. I just wanted to ask you about the quilt painting that you had. What the last one? Talking to him? Yeah. The green painting? Yeah. yeah. Can you?
the two of them together actually, like, oh my god, magic, fantastic. So, so it just, of course, led to looking at other works by Ross. How far back do you want to go? What's available? It's, you know, all of these things come into play. Well, like, you go back to the 70s tomorrow night. I know, tomorrow night, uh, Petzl Uptown exhibition with Ross's work from 74 to 78. Very interesting. Painting from the 70s. Painting from the Actually. So anyway, we didn't go back that far. We looked at, uh, you know, we spent time in the studio. Um, of course, the, the show was still coming together when uh, Ross came to Canada, to Saskatchewan, in the middle of the middle of the West. Um, and we sort of informed him about Emma Lake. There's this uh, prestigious, uh, famous uh, artist residency that was very active in the 50s, 40s maybe, started in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and it was a real connection between uh, the New York School and and uh, other artists that came to this retreat in MLA North, in northern Saskatchewan, a beautiful natural setting, and a lot of very spiritual threads came out of that uh, long-term series of uh, residencies. So we took Ross there to just have a look, to kind of think about this legacy. That added to the show as well, and what we would then bring to, to Wave Hill. And uh, uh, Jennifer McGregor is here, curator that we worked with, uh, right there. And, uh, and, you know, she saw the same sort of uh, relationship you know, between uh, the two artists through their work and the ongoing work that really um, continue to, you know, um, evolve. The exhibition changed until it was uh, uh, finally, you know, presented here in New York. It uh, changed again. I presume it would again if we showed it somewhere else. So um, it was a really triangular process. The kind of selection of works and the when did the venue kind of come into the, the whole project? Oh, I think uh, Zachary had a residency at Wave Hill. Okay. Yeah, and it was uh, actually um, on in the theater. Uh, Yes, Julie Julie Saul. Saul is very instrumental. Exactly. And Putting me in touch with Wayne Hill. And with Jennifer Young. Yeah. 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 So really, it's, it's, it started there. It's a wonderful thing. So thank you, Julie. You're really <laughs> integral in that process. And Jennifer, of course. Organic. <laughs> yeah, so, it, and then, of course, we had time. You know, uh, the, the panic and the trauma and the stress of the uh, of, of COVID came on, so we had just a little more time to think about how we're going to write about all of this, and uh, even to think about the fear and trauma that's still in this room, given that everyone's masked, and there's some level of stress that, what does that mean, you know, for, for the work that we're looking at, both from most of the works from the last 10 years, I would say, a lot of it is more recent though. So there's a lot of thinking up until the presentation of the exhibition and the kind of public relations we have with, with press thinking differently about the work because it's uh, we have that time to uh, see it evolve, evolve and see a relationship evolve as well. So. so sorry to go back to your question about that, about this piece. Um, so it is, it's a, um, a sculpture, it's a ceramic. Um, essentially a frame that, that frames my own hair. So, um, and it, it is a, a, a reference point to Victorian aesthetics and the idea of a mental glory, basically. Um, it is also uh, another reference point is Proust and, and Proust's writing about memory, how he writes about memory. And so this piece developed uh, around those sort of two um, intersections. Um, and I, I started working with, and, and yeah, it is. It, yeah. It, it was it was meant to be sort of a, like an, like an oval shape. So again, going back to the idea, of, is it very Victorian? But it is, yeah, very sexual as well as Ross just mentioned in terms of its shape and its um, materials. Unisexual, yes, sure, sure. <laughs> the hairs on the inside. The hairs on the inside. Well, yeah. So there are these sort of um, uh, flips. Or, yeah, um, um, but that uh, and the title is too long. Uh, yeah, I see it in the, in the catalog. <laughs> the title in the catalog. But that is is the uh, the meaning of the work and the intention. Thank you. Well, okay. your plans for future collaborations? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have plans? 
I learned you to Tori Amos and Joni Mitchell in your CD binder. The smell of your coarse, earthy stubble, my lips stingy swell, the slightest fricative, almost unheard even by me. Three months later, 4 a.m., you propose we let our hair gray together. We let our hair gray together. Which it certainly is. Thank you.